So welcome to Plea Forum and Art Talks 2018. I'm Emiko Ogawa, um, head of Plea Asoftonica, and thank you for coming for this great, great lecture. And this year, um, in the Plea Asoftonica, we have 3,046 submissions from 85 countries, which is really, really huge. And uh, for each category, Five jury members from over the world are really gathering and check um, and in Linz, and they spend fully three days to discuss what is the most important thing, or um, um, and they try to find the criteria. So we uh, Asoktonica doesn't have the criteria that this category should be like this, but every year the jury member really try to see, check all the project, and then try to find. The, the important criteria, what is the important thing for this year. So this pre forum is really the, um, the, the selected prize winning works uh, really reflect the, like the current concern or the reality of the society. So I think you really feel the trend or what's going on throughout today's talk. Then this year, uh, especially we say that uh, 2018 is the digital community's year because even the interactive art plus category, we really see a lot of atmosphere of community. I think you can find this as well, but it's your sense that please um, enjoy the today's talk. And schedule-wise, first of all, we start from the interactive art plus category and next to um, uh, in the next one is the digital communities. And with a small break, uh, we invite the Media Art Market Symposium so that, that they are the work, real um, actual activists and working people who are in the media art market. So in this also point of view, you can really feel what's going on in the media art market field. In the final presentation is the visionary pioneers of media art. The Leonardo community's people giving a talk for um, their, their activities of 50 years. At the end, anyway, I will announce later, but we move to the place and do the Leonardo birthday party. So please join us and enjoy your day. And now I really pass the microphone to the first facilitator and the jury member of Interactive Art Plus, Ruby Thomas. Thank you. Oh, I think I'm on this one. <laughs> so um, just as a little uh, point to um, start with, um, it's probably important to know that when the jury come together, we're not aware of what the, um, the theme for this year's um, festival is going to be. But even not knowing that, I think you will find as you've gone through the pre-awards and also certainly with the Interactive Plus that there really is this thread of error and the art of imperfection throughout all the work. So I think that was a really kind of um, interesting reflection in terms of the uh, theme of the festival and the works um, that were being um, presented into the submissions this year. So I'm just going to do a little bit of a wiggle so I can actually see my words. Okay, so maybe if we could just pop over onto the slides. Oh, thank you. Okay, so this year's Interactive Plus, um, Arts Plus, produced a really large and diverse range of practices and artworks into our submissions. However, rather than the jury thinking ahead about what is Interactive Arts Plus in 2018, we took a community-led approach to understanding the landscape. And we were seeking out the emergent properties coming from the community, um, and we did this sort of via the submissions and through a reflective process of the team. So the emergent hubs of discourse, practice and conceptual focuses coalesced around, but not exclusively to these three broad hubs, robotics, robotics, AI and computation, environmental sensing, memory, knowledge, human connection, new economies and social political concerns, materials, tools and new methods and creative, of creative practice. The mood in the community is as diverse as the work itself. Yet there was this always this underlying echo, um, which was really about the anthropogenic, anthropogenic, the environment, 
human and artificial life. Indeed, all the different ways in which we can actually start to contemplate and think about um, life, which I believe is something that art has been doing all its life. Albeit importantly that this kind of large idea was really um, dealt with and considered through a diverse range of lenses. So I'd like to take a moment to touch on um, these hubs via the honorary mentions, which along with the awarded works reflect this year's Interactive Plus landscape. Through use of con these contextual hubs as a way of working with the submissions, it is also important to note that many of the works and practices bridged over many um, multiple nodes of practice as well. So to start with, so in the AI computation and the contextual hub of robotics, there was a lot of, there was a really broad representation of ideas, such as rather than emerging in the, man, uh, uh, rather than engaging in the manipulation of life on a biological level, artists are really exploring what is the essence of life as an artificial entity. And digital shaman explores, the dem explores and demonstrates how technology or technological processes um, really kind of start to bring about a transformation in everyday aspects of human existence, including the perception of time and death. Also, asking how to create a spark of being in an artificial body. Seeking lifelikeness, computational self, environmental awareness, autonomous social and unpredictability. AI DJ brings an unpredictable and provocative tension to the performance between a human DJ, an AI DJ and the audience. The people and the AI go on a, on a collaborative creative journey together and one that actually starts to find new shifts and spaces in the idea of, um, inter of sound, um, music and, par and participation. raising practical and ethical dialogues about the future of robotics, advances in this field, and our role in their lives and their role in ours, the future society. What does interaction with such artificial entities draw us into? Mother of Machine redefines the relationship between humans and machine in a most intimate way. What does it mean to be the mother of a machine? In the big hub of environmental sensing, memory, knowledge, human connection, new economies, and the social political concerns. Again, there was a diverse range of works that made connections both across and um, across many of these nodes. So Turnstile visualized the new perceptual experience that citizens live with in today, from the individual to the collective perspective. We are immersed in a multiple of realities that both complement and intertwine and actually um, rub against each other in different, at different scales and in different realities, both virtual and physical. This work explored and expresses the increasingly interconnected and interdependent world of the individual with data and also the collective. And importantly for us, this is actually a work that's in a public space as well, so bringing those works out into the public domain. Freedom of speech, labor, and our environment are all deeply influenced by machine algorithms. And pretty soon, if not already, we will stop being able to tell the difference. So works in this hub also raised issues in the shifting landscape of the global economies. Institute of Human Obsolescence puts into practice different interactive devices by which the user can experience what it means to perform biological labor to produce data. Social networks, having entered a well-established period, are actually now being manipulated by various interest groups that may be disconnecting us more than they are connecting us. Echo is an empathy engine seeking to build bridges between strangers. To see and hear somebody else's story seamlessly flow from your own lips and your eyes creates this momentary slippage around ownership and identity, creating an emotional bridge or connection between the audience and the storyteller. Personal data, its value, and, use, and, and uses are potentially threatening the basic ethics um, of shared public spaces. Are we indeed creating a two-tiered or more-tiered global society? Monitor Man presents a public and a live performance working on multiple layers of discourse that are achieved by this really simple, smart, playful platform.
The artist brings us to the spirit of humanity through connection, whilst making manifest the restrictions on individuals' freedom and the, un and the unequal, unequal constraints between nationalities. How do we interact with the established news media and opening questions about how we, the public, in fact, interact with our current events and our social sources and our sources of information? Poppy Interactive shares over 20 years of work from a collaborative team of reporters who wa work in war-torn war areas. Poppy Interactive is a work that is critical in our time of fake news, media reporting and the rapid news cycle. The project offers an alternative viewpoint that provides fertile ground for an in-depth analysis of our current global states. And then into that large, sec the third large hub was really around materials, tools, and the methods of creative practice, VR, AR, MR. So conspiracy, conjoining the virtual, is a work exploring participatory interactions in ways that effectively amplify the tension between competition and intimacy in social spaces. So individual subjectivity within collective decisions is enacted publicly and as participants interact through this sculpture or sculptural form via their VR platform. EEG, wearables, bio data sensing, and collecting and integrating multiple platforms, uh, sorry, or collection of data and also integrating multiple platforms. The other in you brings together haptic feedback sensors, depth cameras, stereophonic audio, and a VR technology to produce a novel dance experience for the audience. The tangible experience of connecting and the extension of the, of the participant um, and the re shaping of the awareness associated with your body are explored through this work. Representations of collaborations, collectives and participatory driven projects shifts in established practice structures resulting in new areas of research, artworks and emergent practice methods. Electronic Electronics, sorry, Electronicus Fantasticus is one of these such projects. It was really is embracing the messy and the unknown. This project is driven by a desire to co-create, prioritize personal stories, and to reimagine new instrumentation through community-based ideation. The project has taken on an energy of its own that is transforming the ideas of ownership and production and practice from the heroic and the professional to the democratic and the porous. Environmental sensing, data exploration. Positions of the unknown takes environmental sensing and the practice, practice research and data exploration to another scale. Using technologies and academic research as sources and inspiration, this artist collective exemplifies the kind of community of practice and the in-depth artistic research necessary to engage with the scientific community, whether this is in collaboration or in dialogue. As you can see, from the honorary mentions and the soon to be discussed awarded works, the Interactive Plus landscape remains a community of diverse interests, activities and concerns. And maybe the plus in 2018 symbolizes the interconnectivity of humans, animals, bacteria, machines, and everything else, the ecology of the collective mind. At that point, I would like to hand over to the Alter team who will um, talk about their work, um, Alter. So hello everyone, good morning. So I'm Ko Hyogao from Japan. So if we could bring our robot to this ROC Electronica today, that would be good, but it's too much you know, you know, complicated and too much big to bring it, it's all expensive. So that's unfortunately we have no you know, real one today. So that's 
at the first, I will uh, you know, show you the video first, and then it's easy to understand what we you know, develop. Start it. This is the altar. So how do you think? Is it a human or a creature or just a robot? So this is what we intended to create it. So actually, you know, about four years ago, the altar has already built, you know. And then we had some very, very, you know, strong intuition that by using this robot, I think we can dig some truths or more fundamental things of the human beings more deeply by using this robot. So it's about four years ago. And then we did many, many experiments and we had you know, hard work to build uh, some algorithm to create it, but actually it didn't work because it's too much, comp too complicated to control for us. And then we thought, so we need a collaborator. And then the idea is the, we know one very, very important person who is there, Takashi. He's a professor at Tokyo University. And we, knows, we knew that we and he has the same big picture or same questions. So do we want to know the, what is a life or what is a human beings. But we have some another aspects. We are more robot-like things, and he has a different aspects. So that's we thought that if we have some collaboration to create some more human-like or creature or lifelike things by using this robot, and it, the result is going to be very, very nice. That's why we decided you know, have some collaboration with him. So this is a brief history of the other things. And today, I would like to introduce our aspect first. You know, my aspect. I am a robotic researcher. And then after that, he talked about his aspect. And then this aspect is probably it's totally different. But it's good, you know, you know it's, it's you know, very controversial and the different things. But it's good, you know, to understand what thinking about, how to start thinking about the, you know, to know the, so what is a human, so what is a life. So, okay. So this is my work. So this is an Android robot, you know, very, very human-like robot is my you know, expertise. Like uh, this robot is not a human, so this all robot is a, you know, the Android robot. And some robot has uh, some model person and some robot is you know, some artificial face. And by using this robot, we want to study to know the, uh, what is the human beings. Uh, we want to know the, some fundamental or, or essential things of the humans or identity of the humans. So since, you know, about 10 years ago, we built that kind of robot and did many, many experiments, many, many research by using this robot and several things is revealed. And then, so we published many papers about it. But for the next step, so, this is the next you know, step for us. We built a very, very human-like robot. And the next step is what is the minimal conditions to be a human or alive? So we decided to create a more neutral phase Android robot. We call it a telenoid. 
This is the second one. So we showed this robot in about five or six years ago in the Aux Electronica. They invited us. So this is a photo of Aux Electronica. Maybe it's a repair things in a tobacco factory. Yeah. And this robot, how, how do you think? I think you can you know, identify the gender or age of this robot, right? You know, to create this robot, we take off the unnecessary features from the human beings for communication. Now, for example, hair, we don't need a hair to have a communication with others, right? We don't need a five fingers, and we don't need a legs for communication, and then let's stop this one. And then there's no, you know, there's some specific gender or age to this robot, and then you can project your appropriate, you know, the, some, uh, you can project or you can feel some actual person into this robot. Now, if we use the female robot, you, know, you can see the, you know, the male person's presence into this robot because it's out of appearance is a female. But this one is more neutral. You know, it's, there's a room for imagination to project the person who you want to see inside this robot, right? And then the next step, what is the next? We want to know more clear or more fundamental things by the, of the human beings or life by using the robot. So the answer is the altar, right? So this is our approach. Okay, and then I would like to pass to you. Okay. This is our approach. Okay, thank you, Kohei. Um, so my name is Takashi Kegami. Um, so I'm very much interested in what they are doing, but we have a very different minds. Right. People from engineering and people from me like physics, it's so totally different. Um, so I was, first of all, I was very uh, criticizing Hiroshi's approach because it's uh, appearing, uh, appearance of a robot is not the answer to what is human or what is, what is life. But I think life emerges in motion and interaction. That's what I have been working on. Like a chemical oil droplet can move around by itself or those uh, big uh, millions of birds interacting with each other and you know, um, self-organizing and making some structures. Or the oil droplet, when they are interacting with each other, they have a different interaction, different dynamics. This is emerging. And this is the computer, just computer simulation of a Gray Scott model. And they, ca they can replicating and inter showing interesting uh, behaviors. Um, so the last year, um, This is, this is one of the um, computer simulations that um, I was working. So it's a, it's a very simple rule, three rules, just uh, uh, aligning the heading directions, um, coming too close to each other, but too close, then try to apart from each other. So I did this one with Victoria Vesna uh, last year in deep space to show what the self-organization is, what's the bottom-up approaches. This is what I call artificial life. So all about artificial life is to understand life as a autonomous agents, but it's not just not just random behaviors, but it's more like you know interacting with each other to make up some rich structures. You cannot predict what's going on from the lower, lowest level, but once you have a structures, then you can understand what's up there. So I thought mind is something like this one. You know, you cannot um, approach from the top level but you have to find some uh, relevant uh, middle layer, and above that, then we can understand what life is, what consciousness is about. So, um, taking this approach, um, comparing Kohei's slide, I'm starting from oil droplet, and they're making a, a conscious machine, or check, or mind time machine, I've never um, presented this one here. Then I'm making more and more complex. So I think life emerges in, in some maximalistic approaches. So me as a scientist and a physicist, usually people take a minimalistic approach, but then something is missing. So I try to um, put more and more, and um, maximalistic approach is one unique way to understand what is life and what is consciousness. That's why I came to work with Kohei to understand, by using robot, to understand how life emerges, how the consciousness emerges on robot and artificial systems. In order to explain uh, briefly what's inside the robot, right? 
uh, I have three uh, unique um, modules. One is uh, CPG is a central pattern generator. It's a chaotic oscillators. So it's periodic oscillators, but uh, infinite uh, amount of perturbation, the periodicity gone and chaotic chaos uh, dynamics emerges, which is CPG here. And they have a recurrent connections, like internal loop. And second one is um, a neural network. So I use um, 1,000 neural networks for each angle, each joint um, of the arms for, for both, both sides. Then the recurrent neural network is um, a recurrent connections to each other and then changing in time. So it's a temporary changing from, uh, from morning to the, to the evening. And third one is um, um, autonomous sensors. One is uh, IR sensors, the other one is ambient sensors. So getting sensors uh, information from outside, then they're changing their structures. So more sensor, more information is coming from outside. They try to slowing down sampling the data from outside, but the sensor, I mean, information is going down, then try to increase the sampling rate. So that's the basic structures, how you can uh, move the Android's behaviors, uh, generate Android's behaviors. So information, sensor information is coming from there, and then processed with the three modules, then uh, send it to the uh, actuators, and then the hands and you know heads, eyes can move around. And one thing is a, a principle. For, uh, the neural network has a principle of stimulus avoidance. Stimulus avoidance is that the neural network is tried not to be stimulated from outside. That's the learning algorithm right here. So if it's too much information is coming from outside, the neural network changes the structures to stop the net, to stop the information from outside. That's as a result becoming a structured behaviors. For example, this one is people coming towards Android, then Android can successfully uh, raise his hand or her hand, then the sensor input is shut down. So they're using this uh, PSA uh, principle of uh, stimulus avoidance is the one uh, learning algorithm that we put in here, which is uh, newly found uh, last year, and it will also uh, tested with uh, actual neural cells. So this is actually working in, in our brain and also in the neural tissues. And after this, this year, we tried to use OTA as a conductor of the opera, which is a very um, challenging idea. <laughs> but then we presented in Artificial Life 2018, it's a conference uh, I will, we organized in Tokyo this year. So this is the t-shirt. <laughs> um, so I can show you how it works. Dodici.
so this one was very successful. And then it was the uh, uh, 22nd of July that we, we did as a, a pre premiere in Tokyo. And this one was, we had a very difficulty in making uh, Android as a conductor because first of all, it looks like, you know, uh, Android is listening to the music and then dancing, right? It's so difficult. It's not a complex metro metronome that you can expect. But a week before the uh, premiere, uh, there was a big transition from um, dancing robot to conductor because we put a uh, breathing mode and um, some um, a weak uh, vibrations, fluctuations of the Android. Then player was a bit skeptical. Maybe this one is a bit living, or some sort of sense of aliving is emerging, right? Then players tend to look up the Android and then play. So there is some time delay, 100 milliseconds or something. So that uh, looks like Android is moving first, and then players is going to play. So this quite nice uh, interaction between human orchestra and then Android is very important. So this is a, a co-creation of Android and then human orchestra. So I come to notice that it's difficult to make a, a simple algorithm put in um, Android to make it live, but you need an interaction between human and Android. That's where the human consciousness is emerging in a, in a, a robot. So the final uh, open question with me and uh, Kohei, we don't have time, sorry. But the open question is, I was discussing with the philosopher Andy Clark, and then say, well, this is, a, the mind is not a simple one. It's, there's no such things like a fundamental a principle like quantum mechanics, right? However, this, whether this messy mind, I call it messy mind, messy mind needs uh, messy sciences, or is there any fundamental uh, laws of physics or fundamental principles that we have to seek for? That's the, uh, you know, um, very, very important question to me, and then also we have been discussing this for many years now. Okay, thank you very much. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm Mary Flanagan, and I have a work um, upstairs in this building uh, called Help Me Know the Truth. And uh, the, I'm going to talk a little bit about the motivation behind the work, and then I'd like to uh, discuss how the work is working and, and some of the implications about it and, and save some time for discussion, because I think there's a lot of interesting uh, crossovers between all of us artists up here. Uh, and the concerns. So, so, so the work is um, is primarily one about um, understanding other people and judging other people through faces and through images of faces. And so, um, I'm inspired by a lot of contemporary rhetoric about facial recognition and the way we're building and participating in systems that ultimately categorize us. So. Um, you know, Facebook has demonstrated its new facial imaging technology, which is 97.25% accurate, which is um, within a percentage point of human accuracy. Um, and they call this the deep face technology, which is really interesting when we think, everything is deep now, by the way. Um, we have deep fakes, deep face, all, and the, you know, there's some other implications to that when you think about the history of pornography. Anyway, um, uh, so very strange, it's very strange. But, um, but, but what's really interesting is not necessarily like the accuracy, can we make our facial recognition systems more accurate? Um, uh, that, that's not really what's, what's, what's inherently um, unnerving me. It's um, that new technologies are moving faster than we can track with legislation or with any kind of management or even public conversation. And technologies are being used, of course, to quantify and record the self. 
And we don't even actually need any evidence of that self anymore. We have everything in terms of data. Um, almost all of these facial recognition systems, Amazon, by the way, has a facial recognition system, Google, Snapchat, for example, right here, um, you don't really need to save the photograph and when you have all the data points from the face in the photograph and you've already constructed a 3D image of the face. So our, our, who owns that? Where is our digital artifact of our three-dimensional representation of ourselves wandering around in the dataverse somewhere linked to our employment, our shopping habits, and everything else? We actually almost have a virtual, they, they actually own a virtual version of ourselves. So. So, so this isn't just a question of this idea of accuracy, although that's what tends to make the news. I really like that um, in the United States, members of Congress are mass, ma uh, matched with um, um, criminals. Um, that's very timely. Uh, <laughs> but it's how the data can be used that's really the challenge. And so, um, and, and, and I, I, I'm bringing this photo up of, uh, of uh, Ruth Porat, who's Google's uh, parent company, Alphabet's chief financial officer. And the, almost every day in the news, if you look at, uh, at the news, which is really hard these days, um, you, can, you can find evidence of humans and their silly, silly biases. And then, of course, their dangerous biases, right? So um, there was an incident where she was uh, talked about in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a financial meeting with Google representatives as the lady CFO. Like, why don't we just ask the lady CFO? Like, there's another CFO for, for the company. There was only one CFO, but for some reason, everyone started referring to her as the lady CFO. And she's like, nah, -uh. we don't need to address my gender when referring to my job title. And, and, and these kinds of, these kinds of uh, unintentional biases, whether they be in hiring practices, whether they be in how we walk down the street, when we feel safe, um, these are leading to large-scale social concerns that we have all around the world. Most recently, um, in, in, you know, you can think of the Chemnitz protests as a, as an embodiment of like fear of the other. We're always, um, as humans, making mistakes and othering people at the same time. This is proven time and time again. And it, it, it's really interesting when you try to decide, okay, well, how can, we, how can we measure that? How do you determine how far off we are? And uh, since 1998, there have been some really interesting research tools. I don't know if people are familiar in the room of the IAT test or the implicit association test developed at Harvard by uh, Mazarin Banaji and Anthony Greenwald. And what they tried to do is put categories together that might be unlikely and see how long it would take somebody to, to actually make a match. So for example, if I give you the prompt of salary, we're probably talking about jobs, right? So you might say career. But when we see the word female, it fights against that idea of career and you wanna to go to male, right? So that, that would be the stereotypical response. So if it takes you longer to answer and then you select female, or if you just select male <laughs> out of instinct, um, then you would be, we, we can actually measure how, how much you're having to take an unconscious process and move it to consciousness and make a conscious decision. So this is really the, the, the kind of science, some of the science behind um, biases, the way we can reveal some of these biases. And, and there have been really interesting um, repetitions of this study about race, about gender, about jobs, um, uh, uh, this kind of thing. But this is like one test out of many, many, many other tests. Um, uh, here's another kind of version of it, uh, bad, good, and you, um, because you know, you, you're, we're measuring people's instinctive reaction time. So I got very, I, I, I run a research lab where I measure um, people's uh, psychological responses to different game interventions for pro-social causes. And I was looking for some new research tools. And I, I, I kept thinking, well, this IAT test is really interesting, but you know, what else is out there? And I stumbled across uh, a different test. Um, because I, as an artist, you know, I'm, I'm primarily an artist, and I wanted to use the tools of science to actually reflect upon what they're, actu what they're revealing and, and what they're revealing about how we see each other. So, so I took this on both as a kind of a research project in my lab, but then also as an artist thinking about, well, how do we, you know, how do we know certain things? Like if, I, if we're walking down the street and it's like, oh, that person's a criminal, how, how do we know? Or how do, how do people know when, when looking in the airport security cameras, oh, that's the person we should track, or that's the per You know, th these kinds of things are so subjective and, and so, uh, <laughs> so unscientific at some points because they're relying on our biases. How can we get to the bottom of these inner workings? So I, I, 
I wanted to keep this exploration alive, and I found um, a different test, and that test is called reverse correlation. And it's used by, uh, by cognitive neuroscientists to actually not just see a, a difference in a bias. So for example, if I see two pictures, I'm, I'm more biased, but to actually construct what's in your unconscious, to construct the bias in your head. Now, how do you do that? How do you do that from, from nothing? How do we construct a face? Well, we can do that, actually. So, so in the actual uh, uh, neuroscience test, they, they, the scientists use vetted um, photogra photographs of a person's face. There are these databases of neutral photos, which is also, you know, kind of funny from an artist's perspective that there's such a thing as neutral photos. But anyway, um, so they can take neutral photos and apply noise patterns onto, this, uh, onto the photos. And the, the noise patterns shift the shadows and the, and the features a little bit, right? And so through adding the noise pattern and seeing if someone um, selects a particular noise pattern over another, we can actually see noise upon noise upon noise shaping the shape and, 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 and look of the face. So it's a cumulative type of test. Now, um, these are the kinds of noise patterns that are, that are that are um, added. So you, to generate the test stimuli in my installation upstairs, you actually get involved as audience members. We use your selfie instead of someone, some vetted uh, psychological image, and we take that selfie, add these noise patterns, and then present it on stations to be judged. So here's what it looks like upstairs. Um, so, so people come to the exhibit, you take a, a selfie at the selfie station, and you, um, you, you, you uh, move through, and these are called choosing stations. And on each one of these stations, the, it's the same photograph with two slightly altered images with different noise patterns. And then I assign a random prompt. So um, when, uh, and, and it takes about, it depends on how many people are taking selfies, but it can take four minutes, for probably under 10 minutes to get from the selfie station into the choosing station. So it's a live process that's, that's happening upstairs as I run the image through the noise patterns, okay? So by selecting these variations um, of, or versions of someone over time, we get a different face. We get different shadows on the face. We, get, we have slight changes. And perhaps the most disturbing thing is that the changes aren't that obnoxious. It's not like I turn into a cartoon character. It's not like I turn into something very different than myself. The, the real creepy thing is actually it's just a slight version. It could be just a shadow on your face. It could be just um, a, a, a little bit different. So here are some images. Uh, uh, after an image is passed through those choosing stations six times, it's labeled permanently in uh, in, a, in a projected display. So here are some from yesterday, um, the people coming to the exhibit. And, you know, again, uh, it, it looks enough like the person to probably recognize them if you know them, but, uh, but, the, but the likelihood is, is perhaps not. So, so I'm really interested in, 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 in how we bring this notion of truth to our, to our, to our technologies, that we can somehow, um, you know, that we're carrying around an idealized image or, or a negative image when someone says select a victim, select an angel, or select a terrorist. How, how, how am I judging what those two things look like? How am I creating the stereotype in my head? So I have to tell a little bit of a story. I'm gonna skip ahead of my slideshow here. Uh, um, I, I have to tell a little bit of a story about the making of this because I have time. Um, uh, and, and think about a, a quote, by the way, from Tishnan Ha, who talks about, we must learn to see that the person in front of us is ourself and that we are that person. This goes back to the robotic notion of consciousness. Like, you know, uh, w what creates a person is perhaps the, the, not the boundaries between us, but the connection between us. So perhaps that's an interesting way to think about this kind of stuff. But I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in this, these, these binary questions that we're asking and, and why uh, we can put them into our technology. But uh, first I wanna look into building the system. I'm just gonna skip ahead to this um, uh, really problematic thing that happened in the construction of this, which, which showed me that this is a uh, continuing, it, it, this, is, this is not old news. So 
you know, there are many coding options out there for, for creating this. So I use this um, Swift 3 as the programming language for iOS. It's running on iPads. Um, and the iOS core image package. So core image is this imaging, image processing uh, and analysis um, tech that um, does low-level graphics processing. It's got an API where you can easily make a camera. And it has this thing, CI, class de uh, CI detector, to find faces in images. So it's already built in <laughs> to the code for your, for your, um, for your uh, iOS to be able to find uh, faces in images. Well, that's nice um, and kind of interesting that it's, uh, you know, is that really well known that every app could actually do this? Like, that's kind of good to know. Um, <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so we're uh, sitting around making this, making this, um, making this uh, uh, picture. It can also tell um, some, some simple uh, gesture and uh, facial recognition. It can see if you're smiling or not, for example. Um, uh, uh, so, so before shipping the material in this first exhibition, I did some tests. I actually installed, I, I teach at a university and I was installing it in my research lab and had all the students coming in and coming in. And um, uh, really interesting, a student came up in front of the work and tried to take a selfie and it, it's a, uh, it gave this, uh, this warning, um, no face was detected. Okay, so we tried other people. I said, oh no, I have a bug, of course, right? Everything has a bug, da, 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 da. And for some reason, it never recognized her face, but it recognized everyone else's face. And I thought, okay, well, why is this, why is this? And then we realized that she wore a headscarf. Now this is the code that is built into Apple products, right? That she's wearing this headscarf, and then we tried to we started doing things. You know, male beards worked fine, you know. And then so we anyway we ended up getting around it. But um, but th that were that our, our technologies themselves have these very inherent biases, and that we're, you, we somehow think that they're these neutral safe things is, 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 is very strange. There are some recent psychological studies which show that people trust answers from a machine more than they trust answers from a person. Um, now, I, I, for me, that's, that's part of what this work is about, that we're actually being asked to be that machine because, in fact, the people making rules are people, <laughs> just like us, with just our, um, our uh, everyday problems. So um, help me know the truth. It's upstairs. I'd like you to try it out. And um, you know, this this th this is part of a larger set of uh, works that I'm thinking about. Um, there's a there's this really ridiculous <laughs> program called the TSA. The, that's a U.S. Uh, uh, if you've gone to the U.S., you've probably run into the TSA. Uh, they're the people who control our. Um, airport security. They have another program called the SPOT program where there's a list of 90-some behaviors that, you, uh, that are completely unscientifically proven about how you can go through an airport and be more suspicious, um, uh, including tapping your feet, whistling, these, you know, these, these mark against you on, the, on their list of things that are, that are, um, that are uh, up there. So, of course, you know, it's cost a billion dollars since its inception, and um, it's completely based on no science. So, so I, I think it's time that we really <laughs> think about um, how messy our humanness is um, and celebrate that, um, and think about the way that we can work in, as in, in some kind of resistance, but acknowledging that we're all still in this resistance. And I, and I, keep, I, I keep fighting with this quote from Foucault about, um, we're never in this position of exteriority. We're all, you know, I, I'm, I'm giving a talk to you on an Apple product while I'm critiquing Apple software. So, the, like, it, it, these, these, these contradictions are the, are the feature of our age and also a feature of a, of a struggle for power. But this question has not gone away, and you probably, I'm going to leave you with this case. You probably heard about this case, uh, uh, I think it was this year, about a woman uh, in China no, known as Yan who uh, used uh, her iPhone, her iPhone 10 was unlocked by her friend. And this is, these are the two women. And, and she, she called Apple, no one would believe her, so she took it to the iPhone store and they gave her a new iPhone and the second iPhone did the same thing. Um, and you know, it's just a clear case of, again, this is, this is, this is a, a tip of the iceberg. It's this inaccuracy about representing things. I'm not asking things to be more um, perfect in their representation that we can be more exact. I, which is the, the, the tech way of trying to solve the problem. I think the humanist way to solve this problem is to say, why do we really want to rely uh, and give up all of this data um, and rely on all the data to make the decisions for us? So thank you.
So hi, uh, thanks a lot uh, that we can be here to present our project. Uh, thanks a lot also to the cyber team, cyber arts team and to Ars Electronica for this event. We enjoy to be here. Uh, I'm Benedict. Hello, I'm Lauren. Uh, we are a Brussels-based artist duo. Um, our work grew out of a shared fascination on new media and is situated at the crossroad of art, technology and social systems. Um, what are the creative drives and patterns of today's uh, digital uh, technology? Where is the line between private and public? And how do our online lives affect the on offline wor world? <coughs> These are some of questions that drive our duo. Concepts such as traceability, data processing, network analysis, algorithms, automation, interactivity are explored in our work. Strategies and practices of new media are above all materials and tools of investigation and creation, allowing works to be developed that questions critical issues of today's society. Together, we founded Larbit's Lab in 2011. It's a research lab on digital technologies located at Brussels, in Brussels. And Larbit's Lab is a breeding ground for international collaborations, so between art and science, uh, that result in uh, critical installations like this campaign we will present, and uh, performance as also uh, events. What makes that we initiate this campaign was the confrontation with the migrants in 2015. When we had our workspace in front of the Maximilian Park in Brussels, where many refugees resided. Our previous workspace was located opposite this Maximilian Park. These migrants found themselves in a precarious position outside of the prevailing social security structures that nation states provide. We simultaneously saw the massive increase of uh, digital wealth that was daily produced by the anonymous crowd on the internet and that is securely and unjustifiably concentrated in the hands of a few number of big tech uh, giant net companies. This imbalance led us to think for, of an alternative social security model that actually took the unevenly distributed digital wealth into account. That's how our latest works were created. Yes, eu for You presents this new step, more focused on social political concerns. The work eu for You is an attempt to calculate the fate of 10 of thousand refugees, refugees to stimulate dia a dialogue and public awareness with regards to the migrant crisis. It presents an algorithm that makes speculations on the fate of the visitors for a golden destiny on European soil, whether they are not citizens of the European Union living or not in one of Europe's member states, are potential candidates, legal or illegal refugees. The work is extremely minimalist. It just shows a mathematical equation of eu for you algorithm as a diagram. The work is an explor exploration of the status of refugees and asylum seekers. It focuses on migration policies at the European level, at a time of big data and algorithmic governance. Whilst eu for you focus on migration controls and 
digitization of borders, the central concern of Bit Republic is put on, on social rights, wealth and redistribution mechanisms, facing those who by force of circumstance are temporarily deprived of it. Bit Republic is part of or is a continuation of eu for you of which BitSoil pop-up tax and hack campaign is one of. Yes, the BitSoil pop-up tax and hack campaign is a campaign for an alternative taxation and redistribution system for an all-inclusive digital economy that surpasses borders of prevailing nation states, social economic structures that leave out those who do not comply to a certain profile. The goal of the BitSol pop-up tax and hack campaign is to propose a more inclusive model for the data economy. Currently, a very large part of the world population produces data. This digital resource, for which we coined the word BitSoil, bits as one as oil was the new black gold, are collected by tech giants who then make enormous profits on the subsequent selling of these resources to advertising companies and other third parties. Every click, every post on the internet generates data. More than two and a half trillion bytes of data are produced daily. With each and every one of contributing 600 to 700 megabytes to the total. In return for free service, we swap this data with Google, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and all, who make a lot of money on it. The digital economy is making billions and concentrate these profits in the hands of a few people. This is what motivates us to initiate our BitSol pop-up tax and hack campaign to make users aware of this total unacceptable situation. To point out the imbalance in the digital economy and outline other possibilities and alternatives. With IBM Watson Natural Language Classifier, we trained a series of bots to spot on Twitter user accounts on a set of predefined data sets of keywords and to trigger Twitter users to join the campaign. It could be, for example, about words related to the topic of data and profits, or on internet companies, or migration. When a sensitive keyword is spotted by one of our bots on the feed of a Twitter account, a pop-up tweet appears on the account of the user that leads him or her to the website of the campaign. There, on the website, Visitors are asked to participate in the campaign and to make their own campaign bots. Participants can configure their bots with a set of action, actions to perform as to send a digital postcard with a tax claim on Twitter to the CEO of a big tech company, to an influential politician, or with an invitation to friends to participate in the campaign. Two kinds of bots were designed for the campaign, prospector and propaganda bots, as well as stack collector bots. The role of the prospector and uh, propaganda bots is to endless stroll Twitter to spot users' account on predefined data sets of keywords. Different from the prospector bots and the propaganda bots are the tax, tax collector, collector bots. They operate downstream just like the taxman, which is the person who collects unpaid taxes from other people or corporations. Tax collector bots are designed to troll net giants, politicians and world leaders with tax claim postcards. These bots keep track of the executed actions and calculate the amount of bit soils, the virtual currency that we developed, in which they can be converted. The more participants, the more postcards, the, excuse me, the more participants, the more, the more postcards will 
accumulate on the Twitter feeds of influential politicians and administrators. A collective claim, therefore, which becomes louder as the campaign gains momentum. The installation is intimately uh, interwoven with the campaign. The installation consists of four server racks that are made up of small printers. If something happens on Twitter or on the platform of the campaign, the installation responds by blasting out smoke, printing bit soils. While the virtual network of the Bitsol pop-up tax and hack campaign extends beyond the borders of nation states, the installation ensures that the project has a local foothold. It acts, it acts as a data center, as a redistribution mechanism. Here, the data are converted into Bitsols, which rolled out via small printers in the form of tickets. Each printer is a wallet that represents a certain number of citizens of BitRepublic. By connecting the digital and the local, the real implication of the online world may tangible. We can imagine someone who falls out the scope of the regular welfare state, for example, a newly arrived refugee, takes a ticket from the machine and buy his food at a local supermarket for the day. Who is who? For this project, we worked essentially with programmers, with uh, Jenny Mainframe for the bot automation part. Jenny is an artist and programmer based in Berlin. She was also involved in a very activist project uh, named Zero, Zero Tolerance. Uh, with Vincent Evrard, which is, is a geek, a graphic artist and a programmer, his project, uh, he has, uh, he, he, in our project, he has been involved in the programming of the back end of the online website. Thanks for your attention. And please uh, join the Bitsoil pop-up tax and hike campaign. turned on. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for all of the three award-winning works. Um, we now have about 20 minutes for questions from the audience. So um, if you've got any questions, please do feel free to put your hand up. And I know now everybody's hands are dropping down by the side of the seats. But I'll get the ball rolling and uh, please join in. Also, artists, as I mentioned earlier, please ask each other questions. This is a panel discussion, so um, it's as much about talking with each other as well as with the audience. Oh, we've already, excellent. Thank you very much, sir. We're up. So let me start off uh, to the Lab Sisters. Well, what I'm confused about is I'm reading you are making money and distributing the money among the participants of your project. And do I get it right? It's just toy money. It's just a piece of paper and everything else is imaginary. Or are you talking about real money, euros or dollars? <laughs> so euros our dollars are also a piece of paper. So <laughs> we, for, for us it's the same, it's a piece of paper and the value is the data. We said the value of this paper is the piece of, uh, is the data everybody is producing. So it's also about speculative design. Another question? Well, actually, this is a question probably now for everyone, um, but I started off with thinking about this with Alta. As we said, the thread of the festival is really around this idea of error, be that 
error as a as a, a way of kind of creating new possibilities, error as a way of bringing those kind of inherent biases and errors that we are not aware of that situate in soft work, and also error in the way that um, our tax systems and our society, um, you know deals or doesn't deal with a very fluid and changing environment. So first of all, can I um, talk to uh, the Alter team a little bit and ask a question, um, you know, how did error play um, a part in, in actually bringing this project together? And, um, you know, these different minds with different kind of disciplines and knowledges and worldviews, um, and starting off in two quite different positions, how did you kind of, um, you know, coalesce together around this project? So I think the Error, so in other words, it's imperfection is always, you know, the very important to, you know, start thinking about the, to, 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 to encourage the human's imaginations for the communication. You know, imperfection means there is not perfect, but it, it means that there is some room for the imaginations, for the peoples. I know when, when we, you know, talking to the robot, and then if the robot is the perfect existence, and then there's no room for the imagination, and then the you know robot need to be a perfect. But if a robot has a, you know some errors, it's an imperfect you know presence, and then we feel some tolerance or you know so that, that that's you know make our interaction in society more good. So that's why for me the error is very important for the communication or interactions uh, you know between human and robot. So how do you think? Yeah, and, and also uh, I want to mention uh, Bergson's uh, creative evolution. So artificial life is all about the evolution, a theory of evolution brain. So how to use the uh, error as a, a source of uh, creativity. It's, it's always our uh, business. And me and Kohei's um, uh, cooperation is, is always misunderstanding. I don't know what he wants to do and people don't know what I want to do, right? But through making robot, you know, our uh, sort of uh, uh, misunderstanding is becoming uh, um, the real something, right? Life doesn't exist in, in, in materials, but life exists in here, right? So we are looking for what's the middle layer that exists, not exists in, in the real world, but that exists in somewhere, right? We are looking for this uh, layer, that the way that we can understand the world, uh, what is life, what is consciousness. Well, I think my I'm I'm kind of fascinated with the imperfection of the mind and our biases. But I would also say, um, you know, as an artist, a lot of times uh, those of us working in technology like our accidents and our surprises, right? So in some ways, for me at least, the art of imperfection is would characterize probably all of my work and how I got to the work in some way. There's always some kind of accident or error. My projects are never fully engineered projects where I understand the outcome. I think I know where I'm going, but sometimes they go. <laughs> and I think that that's part of the pleasure for me as, as an artist, and that's why I'm, I'm more of an artist than an engineer, although I know those are, in this crowd, those are very permeable labels, but. And we were talking about your work earlier and really about how, you know, the. Uh, quite potentially terrifying reality of error and also how um, since the work's been around since 2016 how diff how how are your audiences and how are participants sort of both um, responding to this notion that the system the technical system makes errors or has bias and how has that transitioned as, as an audience you know to to now to 2018 well, and being presented again really interesting I, I I've had the best conversations about this work now versus 2016 so I actually think more people are warming up to the conversation and really seeing the implications I think the implications may not have been as clear a few years ago although uh, although they're, they're still terrifying, <laughs> um, but but I you know I I I give these prompts and the prompts initially were started by this idea of who's a terrorist, who's a criminal, you know. But of course I have who's who's a victim, who's a who's an angel, you know. Who 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 are these good things and bad things, and that's randomly assigned to whoever takes a selfie. So a selfie is randomly assigned this category. And it just that there's error in there. What if someone really is, <laughs> you know, um, a, 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 you know, a really angelic person? They get this angel. It's like, oh, that's so nice. But but there's there's often a disconnect between how someone perceives themselves and how someone is labeled, and that itself is a is a is a kind of error that makes people say, wow, I I don't know how I, 
I don't feel comfortable with that label. Another thing that was interesting is the fear of error. How am I supposed to judge between these two images? This, this has come up a lot in people visiting the work. And finally, um, uh, when we were training the docents and the volunteers, one of the volunteers um, asked a really great question. A little bit of panic in his face, he said, but wait, this is subjective. <laughs> And I said, I said yes, <laughs> and that did that did not sit well with a with a collection of people used to thinking about computational art as somehow having an answer or like there's a visualization that has an outcome. Like I, I don't, it was very interesting to just have that those that those conversations in in process. Uh, well, you know, as we were talking earlier, you know, who, who who do we think is actually making the code and creating these systems? It's us. Um, it's not a neutral other being. Sorry. Yes, uh, first congratulations to everybody for amazing work and uh, a specific question to uh, the sisters. I'm curious if you got any response from Google, Amazon, <laughs> etc. cetera. And um, I just think it's such an amazing concept and particularly the idea of the value being mistaken for money and the idea for bits and oil and how this all circulates, so it actually is a physical and a, it's really fantastic. But I'm curious if you actually made some connection to the big guys. So uh, there are lots of tweets sent by, sent by our bots, made by the audience to these guys, to the big tech uh, net uh, companies, as also to politicians. And uh, actually, some politicians retweeted a tweet from a bot. Uh, also, Tim Cook retweeted. So uh, you can say it's an anecdotal, but yes, why not? Um, we didn't get a negative response from uh, net giants. I think because they find this project a little bit ironical and uh, not weighty and not um, um, uh, yes, just a, a project. So it's not going to disturb uh -huh. them in any way. No. Yes, not yep. dangerous. Hang on. Yeah. Yes. Just yes. a little. I want to dig a little bit deeper into that question. So, for instance, Bezos is now work worth, I don't know, trillion. I can't even imagine the number. Mm -hmm. He does owe society something, right? So they they really should. There should be some kind of taxation system. So I'm wondering if this project can really push further that question. Uh, we, we started with, the proje with, with this project two years ago, and then when we spoke about this idea of taxation system, it was weird, it was weird. But now, now actually on the EU level, there is, this is a topic of the EU level. So, uh, um, they try to find an agreement. There are some countries like France, Estonia, Germany, who are pushing actually uh, to try to tax, uh, to, 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 to find a more fair taxation system for the net giants. So, yes. So maybe it's not a coincidence you're based in Brussels. <laughs> yes, we are based in Brussels. Uh, another question? Yeah, um, I come from a business background and many of the issues that you're looking at are looked at by business people as well in terms of the accuracy of facial recognition or the injustice of um, the consumer providing the value and other people taking it. What is it that makes your perspective on it an artistic perspective? and how do you think about it differently as an artist to the way in which, if you like, the more business-oriented or scientific or even ethics-oriented discussions would, would take it? I will answer. <laughs> um, I will not necessarily have one answer, but there, is, uh, there are some answers. Um, so first of all, I, and I write about human values in the design process, and I think about this, and so so, and, and I use some of these tools actually in research projects, right? So so it's it's very interesting to actually 
on one side, buy into a system that measures and kind of has an outcome, and then on the other side, then critique that process that actually, it's, 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 it's really about disciplinary dialogue and what, what holds water and what, what conversation. Um, for me, making, bringing this stuff into an arts context and, and, and challenging everyone to kind of be a part of the work somehow implicates us in an embodied way um, and this is something I've been thinking about a lot because I, I could go give a talk about bias and, and I actually after making this piece, I wrote an article about othering algorithms and the history of facial recognition, all this stuff. Uh, you know, fingerprinting, phrenology, you, you know, you can go on and on and on about this. It's really interesting. But it doesn't take the place, that, that scholarly writing and, and even a business conversation doesn't take the place of experiencing it for yourself, of being in a place of vulnerability um, and, and trying to have a different perspective. And that's the place for me that, that, that the artwork can actually live. It reaches fewer people. Um, it, it's not a newspaper article. I mean, we, this, all of the kind of stuff that we're, we're all dealing with has been written about ad nauseum. So why, why, why are our pieces somehow speaking to people? It's because we're not done with this. <laughs> we're not processed. We, we, haven't, we haven't, not only have we not solved the problem, we haven't even figured out how, where it sits inside us, I think. So that might be my larger, um, kind of more philosophical idea about this. But I, 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 you know, you can read an article about Google's facial recognition and, it's, and, and, the, and the biases inherent in a technology. It doesn't mean that it changes people's trust, and it doesn't mean it, it, it affects the way we're doing um, everyday life, right? So, so what, would? what would? What would shift people into thinking about stuff? And certainly the conversations I've had with people visiting the work upstairs have been very different than writing an article, doing an op-ed, writing a book about this. So that's how I think about it. Well, um, it's the freedom also. When you can open it, op the, open the box and look at the topic from an artistic, artistic pr um, perspective, it's the freedom that it lets, uh, that it lets uh, to do it, to do things. Uh, there are no rules. So uh, just open the box, uh, look at the topic, mm -hmm. and do the thing. So that's, uh, I think, what we did and what we like to do. Yeah, yeah, well, I don't, I can't answer what's the art perspective of this one, but I, my uh, kind of question to you is, uh, when you make a judgment of face, face recognition or something, but it's your, it's not your consciousness sometimes, right? Uh, people are discussing that before you say, I go right or left, your uh, judgment is already made like uh, five, five milliseconds, 50 milliseconds ago, right? That's what uh, Benjamin Libetto's idea. And it was proved that I was just wondering, you know, even if the, the judgment of a web a decision or whatever it's going, it's, it's all about unconscious uh, network. It's, it's governing all the world, right? So I'm just wondering, you know, if you come up with this kind of idea that, you know, people can judge this and this, but actually it's not by you but the community itself is something. It's, it's affecting everything to your, your brain, right? Right, like the, culture, the cultural biases yeah, and yeah. the larger pool of beliefs right, and ideas. Right. Yes, that's definitely in play. But also, in an art context, um, people start to have conversations. So that slows the process down, and the subconscious becomes conscious. And someone might turn to someone and say, why do I think that person's more suspicious? Huh, that's funny. And then there's a so, so So there's a shift from the unconscious to the conscious. And that perhaps is a place of at least awareness uh, and a, like a metacognitive moment yeah, right. about, about that process. Have you got any more questions from the audience? Yep. Uh -huh. uh, thanks very much for everybody for really nice presentations. And I have a question for Mary. Did you uh, show this exhibit in different places in the world? And did you encounter any like cultural differences in the reaction of people, or maybe intergenerational differences? Let's say yeah, young people yeah, would react I'm, differently than older people. Could yes, you I've show, this is the third show. The first show is in Asturias in Spain, as part of an exhibition at the Laboral Arts Center there in the north of Spain. 
Um, and that project was, uh, the audience was more, uh, uh, the, the, it wasn't so much as a, uh, so, so that was one place. The second place was at UCLA in the Art Sci Gallery. Um, and that was a, a lot of students and professors and, and uh, kind of academic community, although not exclusively. And then here, um, very different reactions at each place. Uh, the, the research on reverse correlation, just the phenomenon of using this technique, um, you know, I'm moving uh, image about six times. In the full-on test, it's about 600 times. So I'm, I, I have a mini version of reverse correlation. But that has actually been conducted internationally to see if some of those stereotypes fit. And there are some surprising commonalities, even across cultures, which is kind of interesting. So I would, if, you, if you're interested in the, the specific data, reverse correlation as the theme has some, has some pretty interesting cross-cultural similarities, which I, I, I was immediately skeptical about until I read the research. And I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> but, um, but the conversations here, I've noticed the older generations are far more suspicious. Like, I don't want, I, you're not taking my picture, you know? Which is very interesting to me because you know the UCLA students. Now one student said, "I'm you know you're not taking my picture." Of course, everybody's taking pictures. They're taking pictures of themselves, taking pictures of themselves, taking pictures of themselves. So, <laughs> so so is th that is very different. Um, uh, and uh, and I would say definitely uh, here has been the most engaged and thinking about policy. People, the press were asking me really kind of difficult and interesting questions, like de detailed questions. So the the so this has been the place where people. Are, people are coming with a base awareness of some of the problems about privacy and security. I would say that the U.S. It's starting like well, it, like well, why is you know? I, I think that there's just less criticality about the technology, especially a, among a younger generation who uses it so much. Um, it, it, it's a smaller group of people who are critical about it right now. Um, and then in uh, in Spain, it was more of an eye opener, like oh, what is this kind of stuff that's happening? And um, because it was the region it was in, I don't think facial recognition is particularly used on the streets, for example. Um, so it's a little bit less uh, common there. So yes, very interesting conversations as it moves around the world. And it's going to Beijing, so again, that very different set of conversations. We just got time probably for one more question. So if there's another question from the audience. Yep. Oh, there's a couple. We could probably go for a couple, sir. Yep. Um, uh, thanks for the uh, live presentation. It was really inspiring. And so I understand in like art or in creation context what the uh, imperfection means, but like in terms of like consumer or like people prospect in daily life, um, what is uh, like key or like technique or hints to be to embrace the imperfection to have a like better life. Like I I work for advertising industry and like it's really like stressful uh, industry and like people are maybe uh, having trouble and problem to be a stressful daily like modern life. So maybe imperfection or like error means maybe positive or it can be positive message for uh, people. So I want to hear about that. Yeah. I'll pose it. I'll pose it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a meaning of the error and the consumer. Well, it may be the error. Yeah. So I, I think the error is not, you know, it, not, not existing in our society. The error is generating by, you know, progressing the technology. So that's, I think the error is, you know, not always put negative things. The error is sometimes so positive to improve the technology. So this is my answer to you. Oh, uh, oh actually, there is no error, right? I mean, I'm sorry about this <laughs> saying this, because um, you know, people tend to think that symmetry is uh, better than asymmetry, right? Something is always starting from a very symmetric, and then um, breaking the symmetry and then goes to some messy something. However, like um, um, back in Greek era, there is a Epicurus, a philosopher, and he's saying, uh, he says, Krinamen is the basic thing is always uh, uh, differences. It's slight differences amplifying. That's what he says. And it's very different from a modern science, right? It's always making error. The big making error is the basic thing of the world. That's what the Krinamen is about. That's what a, a philosopher Epicurus says. 
And then uh, this little difference is, well, actually this Marx um, wrote a PhD thesis on this Epicurus. So it's not error, it's always something is, is changing, right? The modern science thinks that the symmetry is a base and everything is starting from here, right? Symmetry breaking is all about science. However, error is the basic thing, right? That's what we have to believe, that that's what we have to base on. And then Android is the very good example that life emerges not from the symmetry, but from the noise and error. So that's what I, our message is. Thank you very much. It was very inspiring and beautiful. Uh, I have a question from Mary. Uh, does your work, your facial recognition, work on really black faces, very dark faces? Uh, yeah, it does. It's, 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 um, the stealthy station is lit and it's high contrast, so yeah. It, it, but again, you know, it's using a, it, it is using a, a black and white um, uh, noise pattern, but it does, it does work on, on everybody's face. It, adds, it changes the face because it's, again, the point of that project is not, fa my critique is facial recognition, but the point isn't facial recognition so much as changing that face to fit a stereotype. So it, it, it does change over time. And um, on that note, I think we've come to the end of the session. So I'd just like to thank you all very much for spending the time with us to talk about your um, uh, projects and to congratulate you all. It was a massive pool of submissions. It was a really interesting and diverse pool. And for all of your works to come through that and really, as I'm sure the audience has sort of really sort of understood and seen, these works ca encapsulate all of those discourses and conversations that were arising in the Interactive Arts Plus category. And they are really um, projects that have uh, a real life to them, an extended life to them. It's not just about a trend of today or this year, but actually these are deep projects that have been building up and are really tackling important parts of our society for today and tomorrow. So I'd like to thank the audience for spending time with us and I'd like to thank the speakers. So thank you very much.